everyone, Jeremy, and I'm going to be telling you all about electromyographic sensors and signal processing. Before we go too in depth about EMGs and what they do, let's first talk about a brief review of what EMGs set out to record, and that is muscle function. So when you move one of your skeletal muscles, that motion starts out as a sensor in your brain, sorry, a signal from your brain. The signal goes down through your spinal cord from your brain to the main motor neuron of your muscle and that motor neuron, when it gets activated by your, your brain signal, uh, fires an electronic signal down the length of your muscle. And what that signal does is it creates a polarization and depolarization in your muscle known as the action potential. And that action potential spreads down your muscle and activates the uh, motor neuron axons in your muscle and all the sarcomeres along the strands of your muscles uh, are activated by the signal. The myosin in the sarcomeres are activated. They grab a hold of the actin strands on either side and pull them together, and thus your muscles contract. So the point of EMG is to record that action potential or electronic signal that starts up your muscles' motion and signals your sarcomeres to contract. Electromyography has a various number of uses uh, one of the most important ones is medical diagnostics. For example, you can um, hook up an EMG to a muscle and see what kind of signal and activity the electro, the signals uh, in the muscle exhibit at rest. And if you're getting abnormal muscle activity and things like that, it can lead to a slew of problems that you might need to look into. Uh, rehabilitation is another use. Human-computer interaction is also very popular for EMGs. I'm sure some of you have probably seen uh, various prosthetic arms that people are controlling. So they'll have like a, an array of EMG sensors along an arm, and when you move a finger, the EMGs that are uh, measuring your finger muscle movement will correspond to the prosthetic limb and move the prosthetic limb's finger. And you can use your actual arm to control a robotic arm or some sort of computer program and it makes a very natural intuitive controlling mechanism for computers. They can also be used in sports therapy or training. Uh, an example I saw a few times was in uh, Olympic shooting sports. Uh, one of the interesting things about them is that shooters have to remain extremely still so they'll often hook themselves or sometimes they'll hook themselves up to an EMG sensor to see which muscles they're moving so that they can think about that more in their stance in the future and not move them so much. Uh, there are EMGs are also popular in biomechanical research for us to get a better understanding of how our brain controls our muscles and uh, that sort of thing. The uh, EMG system has various components. The muscle is important even though it's not exactly a component of the EMG system itself. So the muscle fibers are going to create your action potential. That action potential is going to be de detected by an electrode array. The signal that is picked up by the electrodes will be put through an amplifier because muscle or action potential is a pretty small amplitude signal, so it needs to be amplified quite a bit for a game for you to really get a sizable signal that you can really uh, interpret and mess with. The amplifier is going to be put through a filter so you can filter out artifacts, uh, power line noise, and things like that that you don't want. Uh, the data from the filter is going to be put to an analog to digital converter so that your analog waveform from the electronic signal, or the yeah, electric signal from the muscle, can be discretized into a set of data points that the computer can interpret. And then lastly, your data points from the analog to digital converter, you're going to want to process on some sort of uh, computer program. For this presentation, my examples will be using MATLAB to process the data set from an example uh, EMG set that I found online. Uh, the typical electromyographic hookup involves uh, three, usually uh, three electrodes. Two electrodes are going to be placed along the muscle, one electrode will be placed in the center of the muscle, and the other electrode will be placed at the end of the muscle. And these two electrodes are going to be measuring the potential difference between the middle of the muscle and the end of the muscle as the electronic signal or electric signal goes through your muscle to activate it. And you'll have a ground electrode somewhere um, away from the muscle as a reference node. There are two main types of electrodes used, surface and intramuscular. Surface electrodes are very common among other um, 
measures as well, like EKGs and EEGs. They're simple, they just stick to the skin. They have a metal uh, conductor in the middle with some electric jelly on the other side so that the electronic signals can be read through your skin and to the electrode and down the wires and onto your uh, processing units and all that. The advantages and disadvantages of surface electrodes is that they're, they don't really cause the patient much discomfort. They're just a little pad that you stick on, single use you take off when you're done. Uh, they don't really require any special training. You still need to look at graphs and whatnot to make sure that your electrode placements are placed properly. It's very important to get the placement right, but I'll talk about that more later. The disadvantages about the surface uh, electromagnetic technique is that your readings are limited to muscles very close to the surface of your skin. So they cannot measure muscles that are too far below other muscles or too far from the skin. And there is also the factor that they will pick up a, some signal from adjacent muscles. So you're going to get a little bit of a signal from adjacent muscles leaking into the signal from the muscle that you're trying to interpret. Also, the signals can get very much impeded by adipose tissue. And this, I just thought this was hilarious. It looks like they just scotch tape battery connectors to their arm. I just wanted to include that because I thought it was funny, but I, I can't imagine that would get a very good signal. I would love to see what kind of response they get from that. Yeah. But the next set of electrodes, intramuscular, it involves everyone's favorite medical apparatus, big pointy needles. So these are typically a shielded electrode, usually use glass or something, so that only the very tip of the electrode is exposed and the electrical signal will only be picked up by that and then it will be routed through your electrode and on down the wiring. These probes have to be inserted directly into the muscle, through your skin, through other tissues and things like that. So then very obviously a, a disadvantage of which is patient discomfort. Some skin conditions can be inflamed pretty substantially by having a needle stuck into your muscles. And in some studies where patients have to be uh, measured for several days or something in a row, this can cause quite a bit of discomfort in the muscle because you have to keep jabbing it. Another fun thing about this is oftentimes the first time they insert the electrode, it won't be in the proper spot, so they'll have to remove it and insert it somewhere else again. So it might take them a few tries to get in the right spot. So that's not fun either. But this it, method does have some advantages too. It can, um, it can measure any sort of muscles, even ones deep within other muscles and it does not get much, if any, signal from adjacent muscles. So surface electromyography is a lot more convenient, but in a lot of cases, you have to use intramuscular electrodes, and the surface electrodes just won't really be applicable. Also, these muscles, sorry, these needles, obviously require a lot more training and experience than surface electrodes, because you don't want just anyone stabbing you with some sort of needle. Here is, an example set up for a diagram, a circuit diagram for an electromyogram. Uh, your first step is going to be your instrumentation amplifier. Um, you're going to have two main leads for this. One's from the mid muscle and one is the end muscle. I was talking about earlier that that's where, how you measure the difference. Uh, this part here is going to be your ground or reference electrode. And the reason you would want to use an instrumentation amplifier, two main reasons. First of all, it has the common mode rejection ratio so that any signals uh, in both electrodes are going to get filtered out mostly so that can take care of things like power line interference and other sort of noise that you don't want. And also, um, they can have a pretty sizable gain on the instrumentation amplifiers and it, muscle, muscle potentials are relatively low so you need to boost them up. This the next step, you're going to want to have some sort of amplification and a filtering. In this signal, they have um, this gain negative here to balance out the negative gain of the uh, filtering the filter, amplify it so that this is going to give you a positive signal and this will make it negative and this will make it positive again so these two kind of balance it out and keep the signal positive. Um, for this circuit, they used a high pass filter of around 100 cutoff frequency. There are two very common filters that you would use in your circuit, either one at 20 hertz or one at 100 hertz. When I get on to the topic of signal processing and artifacts and things like that, I'll discuss uh, which 
frequency you would want to use for what situation. But the most popular ones is a high pass filter at 100 or 20 hertz. And this particular filter has the RMS and rectification system built into the signal. Um, when I talk about signal processing, I'll explain what exactly that means. But basically, these are optional components that are used for signal processing. They can either be done in your circuit as depicted here, or you can process it later. So this setup will not give you a raw EMG. It will give you a, an average one straight out. And then this inverting amplifier, I'm assuming, is to balance out this, the inverting gain and the smoothing amplifier as well. So then this is going to give you a nice uh, equalized, rectified, positive uh, signal from your EMG. And the next step after the data comes in from the muscles and gets filtered, it's going to go, your voltage output is going to go to your analog to digital converter. This is the part that will convert the analog waveform data from your EMG signal to a set of digital data points that the computer can recognize. Uh, EMG frequencies uh, for muscle action potentials are typically regarded as in the range of 20 to 500 hertz. So the commonly accepted minimum sampling frequency of an analog to digital converter for EMG is usually regarded as 1000 hertz. Uh, but if you want to be a bit more accurate, how, whatever kind of data you're working on, I personally probably use 1500 hertz myself. And an example of an analog to digital converter would be a, an Arduino microcontroller. Those are pretty commonly used by researchers or students. But if you want something a bit more user friendly for use in a hospital or something, you can get a more robust analog to digital converter that's specifically made for EMG. And for EMG signal processing, once you get that uh, signal out from your analog to data converter, you got a bunch of numbers and now you need to figure out what to do with it. So there are three main uh, techniques used for processing electromyg sorry, electromyographic. I was hoping I could get to the process without calling it electromyographic, but um, <laughs> you got rectification, uh, root mean squared enveloping, and Fourier analysis. So rectification. Uh, when you receive your raw EMG data, assuming you don't have the rectification and RMS components of your circuit, you're going to get something that looks a bit like this. You will have amplitude peaks on the positive and negative polarity. And the problem with this is when you average these peaks, EMG signals naturally average at about zero. Obviously, you can't really do anything if your data average points are all out zero. So you need to find some way to convert your raw data to sounds like it's starting to rain. It's raining, no, it's yeah. Raining. To, <laughs> to all one polarity. There are two methods by which you can do this. Uh, there are full wave rectification, where you just take the negative polarity. Well, it doesn't have to be the negative. You, either want it all positive or all negative, but we'll assume that you want your signal all positive for now. So you basically just take the absolute value of your data set. So all of these negative points just get flipped into the positive range. It can look pretty similar, but if you look at some peaks, you'll notice that they just get inverted. This is regarded as the preferred method for rectification because all signal energy is conserved. Whereas with the alternative, oh, I'll get to the other. But with the alternative half wave, you lose some data. So this is some sample uh, MATLAB code I ran for rectifying my, well, the uh, sample data I found. This is a lot of data points. This was sampled at like 4,000 hertz over 12 seconds. So it's kind of hard to tell that there's any difference between the, the top half of those two. But, um, well, first of all, for your code, you're going to want to load in your sample data. And this part here is just for plotting it. That's going to be the top right EMG. Uh, I used NA as the units as a placeholder. It's supposed to be millivolts, but I guess I forgot to change that later. So the EMG should be in millivolts. But that's the top right graph. The uh, rectified uh, version here is a very simple, just one line of code to rectify it. All you do is you take your data set and you apply the absolute value to it. So that's going to give you the full wave or rectified EMG off of the sample one. And then it will be plotted here. 
Now the half wave is what you do is you take the negative or whichever polarity you don't want, you just delete it. You just chop it off right there. So that is not really a commonly used method because it deletes data. You can lose some data. You can potentially lose out on some information that you might want to know. So maybe someone somewhere has some need to do that, but typically people go with full wave. Half wave is also uh, takes a little more coding to process on MATLAB. I omitted the um, part for graphing the raw EMG. So for the half wave to process that, I loaded up the half wave uh, rectified signal to just be equal to the EMG because the time vector was included in this data set and I just wanted to carry it over for the half wave. And then I wrote a for loop. So uh, for the length of EMG at every time point, it checks the corresponding EMG value. If the EMG value at the time point it's checking is greater than zero, it just copies it right over. But if the time, the uh, EMG value at the time point is less than or equal to zero, it just replaces it with zero. So as it goes through the script, it just checks, is this greater than zero? Okay, it's good, move on to the next one. This one's less than zero, okay, delete it, replace it with zero, move on to the next one. So it does that and rectifies the full uh, signal there. And then this code down here is just plot it. It can be hard to tell the difference, like I said, on this data set, but if you notice these two peaks here, this one's considerably lower than that, but if we go to the full wave rectification, they're about the same. Can so you just go back to one slide there? So this second... This is a different data set. Right, but this is half wave? Yes, this is half wave rectified, because the bottom is just deleted. Right, okay, it's the opposite. So the other one is the full See, like on the first one, you can see... Yeah, where, uh, yeah the same, yeah, same peak just, here. Just the, up there. Otherwise, it's still okay. Okay. Now the root mean squared or RMS envelope is basically just an average of your signal as you go. So for every point it goes out a certain distance in either direction and just averages all the peaks within there. So it's a sliding average. Every point has like a little window that it averages the peaks of and it just does that point by point along the graph and you end up with this red signal here which is your averaged data from the peaks of your EMG. The RMS is typically regarded as the most statistically important data, and it's regarded as more or less the signal that you're actually receiving at any time point, rather than your absolute value. It gives you a bit better data to work with for calculations and statistical analysis. So this is a code for RMS enveloping. I went with the filtration method, which is very comparable to what we saw earlier. Well, the important thing of a root mean squared envelope is you have to rectify your some signal first. You cannot root mean squared your uh, raw EMG data or you just get an average of zero, like I mentioned earlier. So you have to rectify it first. And then you set up your sampling frequencies and you want to set up a digital low pass filter to at a very low frequency to smooth out your signal and kind of average it. So this here, this commit, this part is the cutoff frequency. I just set it to three hertz, kind of arbitrarily chosen. But the greater the number, the higher the frequency, the more rough your signal is going to be. So if I set this to like 20 or something, it you know jump around a lot more. So it really depends on what you want to do with your data uh, and what frequency you want to set it to. So if you want it rougher for some reason, you'd set it higher. If you want it really smooth, then you'd set it lower. Uh, this command's going to be the filter order. This part here is going to be uh, creating the filter's parameters off of the order and the frequency and your chosen topography. I went with Butterworth, as far as I can tell, that's one of the more commonly used filter topographies for it. And then this command here is just going to apply your digital filter and the rest is going to plot it. And you're going to end up with something like this where you can see your RMS plot uh, along with your rectified plot if you want to be both in the same plane. And these plots here, the root mean squared, is on the time domain. So you're going to see your amplitude and whatnot. But sometimes, for some research, people might want to see uh, the frequency at which the muscles are activating. For higher, um, faster twitching muscles, you're going to have a, a higher um, frequency. For slower twitching muscles, you're going to have a lower frequency. So this is one reason that you might want to not include the rectification 
and RMS uh, components to your signal because to apply a Fourier transform you need your raw EMG data. So if you have the um, components in your signal to go ahead and process the rectification in RMS for you, then you won't really be able to do Fourier transform. So this is what a Fourier transform of an EMG is supposed to look like, more or less. You should see most of the signals probably in the 100 to 200 hertz range, and pretty much all the signals should be between 20 to 500. But, oh yeah, one more interesting thing is the lower frequencies are typically regarded to uh, muscle fatigue. So as you fatigue a muscle more, the more you use it, the lower the frequency of its activation potentials are going to be. This is what my data set looked like. So I'm wondering if maybe there was a lot of noise in the signal, or this is a generated signal that I found, but I couldn't really find anything else to really gauge it on, so I'm unsure about that. Uh, I won't go into too much discussion about the uh, fast Fourier transform command I used because that's what Ian was going to talk about, so I'll let him talk about that later. But this is just the standard Fourier transform of converting your signal into the frequency domain so you can see what frequencies are most commonly shown in the, the muscle, if uh, your research needs for you to know that. And as for most biological signals, you're going to have to be concerned about artifacts and filtering and just what can go wrong with your signal and the things you might need to keep an eye out for and know how to get rid of. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the electrodes you use for the uh, EMG are actually, I'm pretty sure the same as the electrodes you would use for an electrocardiogram. So there is the potential issue of having electrocardiogram artifacts in your EMG. As you can see here, there's uh, EKG artifacts alongside the EMG. They can be very difficult to remove if they're present, but placement of your electrodes can uh, be a, probably the best method to try and avoid getting electrocardiogram artifacts in your EMG in the first place. For the, uh, if you have your sensors on the same side of your body, typically the EKG signal will get filtered out by the instrumentation amplifier, the common mode rejection ratio. I'm not sure why you would have electrodes on opposite sides of your body for a muscle, but uh, also placement of the um, sensors along the axis of the heart can also cause these artifacts. And I mentioned earlier about filters. You'll commonly see a 200, sorry, a 20 hertz or a 100 hertz high pass filter on your, EK, your EMG circuit. And this is mostly the reason for it. If you're, for some reason, having an issue with EKG or you want to make sure that you're not getting EKG artifacts in it and you're not concerned with the lower frequencies some muscles might put out, then you might want to put in a 100 hertz uh, high pass filter to filter out EKG artifacts preemptively because most EKG artifacts should be filtered out by something at 100 hertz. Yep. Uh, otherwise, some muscles, you'll notice that the 20 to 100 hertz range is still within the uh, hertz that some muscle signals are uh, recorded at. So if you do filter by a 100 hertz high pass filter, you might lose some uh, signals that are important for your data set. So if you're not terribly concerned with EKGs, you're probably going to want to just put in a 20 hertz high pass filter. Otherwise, you'll use a 100. So you want to use a 20 if possible, but sometimes you might need a 100 if you for some reason EKGs are a problem. There's also the issue of muscle crosstalk, which is mostly just an issue with uh, surface EMG sensors, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, these are caused by potentials from adjacent muscles leaking over into the action potential of the muscle you're trying to record. And the best way to get rid of this is just for good placement of electrodes. If the electrode's directly on top of the muscle and it's just really close to the sensor, sorry, the uh, neuron that you're trying to measure, then the signal is going to be stronger than the adjacent muscles enough that they won't influence the signal as much. But that's pretty much the main thing you have to do to get rid of muscle crosstalk, because you can't exactly filter out the adjacent muscles signal because it's very comparative to the signal that you're actually trying to measure. There are also movement artifacts. Since there's quite substantial gain in EMG circuits, even just moving the electrodes or the cables can cause artifacts. 
So for something like that, you'll want to either tape down the uh, electro leads and wires or whatnot. Or this is why you would typically use a 20 hertz high pass filter as a minimum, because that should get rid of your um, movement artifacts. Otherwise, if you know, if you're seeing a signal here and you know that the muscle wasn't moved there, you can just manually remove it. And then it's the only three things in life are guaranteed are death taxes and 60 hertz noise. You have to be careful of your power line. Mostly that's going to get filtered out by your instrumentation amplifier's common mode rejection ratio, but just in case it's still present in your uh, signal, you just use a notch filter to get rid of what's ever le whatever's left of it. And that's everything I want to talk about at EMG. Those are my sources. Are there any questions?